Hi everyone, welcome to Volcano Tuesdays. My name is Gina and I work as an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. We are a nonprofit that teaches about the science and stories of Mount St. Helens. We hope to inspire the curiosity and questions that you have about volcanoes. Volcano Tuesdays is a free online education series. You can see an archive of all past episodes on our website, mountsthelensinstitute.org. A new episode is released each week at 11 a.m. Pacific time, and each week includes a live demonstration as well as challenges for you to do at home. Take a picture of yourself, friends, or family members completing the challenges and send to us. We will feature each week. Also, tell us what makes you interested about volcanoes. Each week we design our programming to meet the requests and questions that we receive from you. Thanks for supporting Volcano Tuesdays. A special shout out this week to Ava from Danville, New Jersey, who sent us this fabulous poem about Mount St. Helens. I'm going to read it out loud. The sky turns black with harmful ash, the end is drawing near, but still we fight for death and life, though all is doomed, the time is now, so take a vow, those who fought St. Helens. Thank you so much, Ava. It's so exciting to receive submissions from you all the way from the East Coast in New Jersey. Way to go. We received this poem on the anniversary, the 40th anniversary of Mount St. Helens erupting. This week, we are going to think about what happens when volcanoes go kaboom and release a bunch of ash up into the atmosphere. To learn more about this, we're going to bring in a very, very special guest named Sonia Melander. Sonia also works at the Mount St. Helens Institute. She is a big volcano nerd. Sonia grew up along the coast of North Carolina in a place where no volcanoes are currently erupting, but she remembers learning about and being amazed by the story of the Paracutine volcano in Mexico in third grade. In college, Sonia studied physics and geology, and she worked in a laboratory that studied the chemistry of volcanic rocks and looked at pictures of volcanoes from satellites. She was hooked on volcanoes and went on to earn her master's degree in volcanology, that is the science and study of volcanoes. After that, Sonia worked as the education and outreach officer for a volcano observatory in the Caribbean island of Montserrat, and also at Craters of the Moon National Volcanic Monument in Idaho. Now she works at Mount St. Helens and we're so excited to have her on the show today. Let's welcome Sonia and thank her for her special guest presentation. This is a photo of Mount St. Helens erupting on May 18th, 1980. But what exactly is it that we're looking at here? Well, this is something that's called an ash column. There's other words for this like ash plume, eruptive column, we're just going to stick with ash column because that's a good word to call it. So when volcanoes explode, they can throw out a mixture of hot gas and rocks that are swirling around in this hot gas. And this is all the stuff that you see in this picture that looks like gray cauliflower. Today, I'm pretty excited because I have some rocks with me that actually came out or thrown into the air in the 1980 eruption. I'm just gonna go over here and grab my first rock. And this rock is called a bread crust bomb. And this is one of my favorite rocks because I like bread, but also because it's really neat. So it's called a bread crust bomb and bomb is the word for volcanic rocks that are thrown up into the air that are pretty large. This isn't the biggest rock that Mount St. Helens threw out when it erupted in 1980. Some were the size of small trailers. But in this ash column that you see swirling around, there's rocks of all different sizes. So there's rocks that are smaller too. Rocks like this one right here, this is a smaller bright crust bomb. Rocks like this one. This is a piece of hummus, another one that makes me hungry because it makes me think of hummus, which I think is delicious and something called volcanic ash. So volcanic ash is rocks that are kind of the size of flour or um, powdered sugar. They're really the size of this like flour, it can get as big as the size of a pencil tip, 
um, really, really tiny volcanic rocks. But just because they're tiny doesn't mean they're not important. So let's take a closer look at this ash. So this is a photo of ash taken by something called a scanning electron microscope. So it zooms in really, really, really far to take a picture of this tiny, tiny piece of ash. This piece of ash is about the size of the width of two human hairs, so very, very tiny. And I think it has a pretty interesting shape. So something that I want you to do is I want you to take about five seconds and notice what you can about the shape of this rock and think about how you would describe it. Okay, five seconds starting now. Great. So when I look at this rock, I think about how kind of sharp and jagged it looks. And it is. Not only that, this rock is made out of glass. So this volcanic ash that comes out, volcanoes when they explode are really tiny pieces of sharp glass. So ash again can be really, really tiny. And again, that doesn't mean it's not important, especially when you have a lot of it. So how much was there in 1980? Well, Mount St. Helens threw out 1.4 billion cubic yards of rock. And this is really hard to imagine, but we're gonna try. So I want you to stretch your arms out into the air, pay attention to your fingertip, to your fingertip, make a note of that distance that's about one yard. So I want you to imagine a box that is that wide, that wide in the other direction and that tall. And I want you to fill that box with rocks in your mind. That's already gonna be a really, really, really heavy box. Now I want you to take that box and I want you to make it 10 times as big. That's a lot of rock. Now make it 100 times as big, 100 times as big as that, um, as that 10 times as big. So much rock. Okay, now this is a whole bunch of rocks we're trying to imagine in our head. It's getting kind of hard because so much. And we're going to multiply all of that by 100 again. And guess what? We're not done. So take all of that rock and multiply it times 100 again. This is getting really, really hard for me to imagine. I don't think my brain can think about that much stuff. But guess what? multiply it by 100 times again. So Mount St. Helens put so much rock up into the sky. Now, what is it like when volcanoes erupt explosively and erupt this ash? How does it affect people, all this rock going into the sky? To explore this, we're gonna watch a short video made by Vol Film. It went black. It was all pervasive. It was never ending. The smell of sulfur. We started running home. We ended up getting caught in it. Todos los árboles quedaron sin hojas. It actually covered the sky. It totally blocked out the sun. So let's go back to the May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens eruption and ask ourselves what happened to that 1.4 billion cubic yards of rock of ash that went up into the sky. Well, first, of course, it went up into the sky and it went up 15 miles into the sky. It actually made its way 15 miles in less than 15 minutes and it kept going. That rock was being thrown 15 miles into the sky for nine hours. Once it reached that height of 15 miles, then it was blown by the wind to the east. As the ash would go to the east, it would then begin to fall down onto forests and onto communities. When this ash would fall down, it would be kind of like snow. Kind of like snow, except of course, it's rock. So it was covering forests in what looked like snow, but it's rock covering forests in rock and covering communities in that same rock. Communities like Yakima, Washington. This is a photograph from the early afternoon of May 18th, 1980 in Yakima, Washington. 
That day would have otherwise been blue skied. This would be the time when the sun would be shining bright, but you can see it looks like nighttime. And that's because the sun is being blocked out because there's so much ash in the air. So that ash is falling down from the cloud, down to the ground, blocking out the sunlight. And there it is in Yakima, Washington, where people are, where the community is. So people would wear masks to protect themselves from this ash. Remember again, that ash are tiny pieces of sharp glass that happens to come from a volcano. Do you wanna breathe that in? Definitely not, nobody does. It's not good for you. So people would wear masks to protect themselves. And they also had to put a lot of work into protecting their communities because rock is heavy. So when rock falls down from the ash clouds, down to the ground, onto buildings, it can cause roofs to collapse. This is a photograph, not from Mount St. Helens, but from a volcano called Cinnabung um, after it's one of its eruptions in 2014. And you can see that the roofs have collapsed. And that's because, again, rock is very, very heavy. So it can be very damaging to buildings. It can be very damaging to other parts of the community, like if it gets into storm drains or wastewater drains that can be very damaging. So people put in a lot of work to clean up ash after it damages their communities. Then you have to think about a place to pile it. It's a big mess. Um, it's dangerous. It's a lot of work for people who are in communities even very, very far away from the volcano. It can also be trouble for people who are up in the sky. This photo is a picture of an airplane um, from a, well, a picture of an airplane uh, that was grounded and there was ash that fell down on it, ash from a volcano called a Pinatubo. Again, ash is heavy. That's why you see the back section of the plane dragging on the ground. But I want you to imagine that this plane is in the air and there's ash in the air. So this plane is soar soaring hundreds of miles per hour through the sky, through air that has a bunch of ash in it, tiny, tiny pieces of sharp glass. So that sharp glass is scratching along the side of the airplane. Do you think that's a good thing for the plane? Definitely not. Um, not only because of the ash and what it's doing to the outside of the plane, but also because of what ash can do to the inside of the plane. These types of planes with large turbine engines suck in lots and lots of air as they're flying along. And so if that air has volcanic ash in it, there's volcanic ash going into the engines of this plane or this kind of plane where it can be very, very hot, so hot that it melts the ash and coats the inside with glass and that can cause airplanes to stall mid-flight. This is clearly very, very dangerous. And so scientists and emergency officials want to be very, very careful. To do that, we need to study volcanoes and learn how they work. At this point, we are gonna put our thinking caps on and we're gonna think about what would happen to this volcano in two different scenarios. For, so for this short activity, I want you to get out some drawing supplies. So I'd like you to get some paper, and I'd like you to get something to write with, whether it's a pencil, pen, or crayons and markers if you want colors, but that's not necessary. Um, just enough to draw two volcanoes in two scenarios. Pause this video if you need to go and grab that stuff. Otherwise, here's what you're going to do. Okay, I want you to think about this. So what would this volcano and its ash column look like if it erupted on a day with a strong wind in one direction? So think about that and draw it. Strong wind in one direction. And then I want you to think about what if there was no wind? What would the volcano and the ash column look like on that kind of a day if there was almost no wind? And how are the eruptions on these days similar or different? So I'm gonna give you about one minute to do this. Of course, you can always pause the video if you wanna take more time, but for now, we're gonna count down one minute.
Okay, so now that you've had a moment to draw, and of course, time to think about it, let's see what it actually would look like. This is a volcano called Augustine Volcano. It's in Alaska. And on March 26, 2006, this is what it looked like. Now, I want you to let you know, this isn't really much ash coming out of the volcano. It's mostly steam, but it acts in kind of the same way. So you can see this is on a day with wind and the steam plume, in this case, the steam column is being pushed way to one side. Now the next day, steam also came out, but it was looking a little bit different. Let's take a look. So on March 26, you can see it was coming out at about the same height, but totally, totally different. It was spreading out all over the place on this much calmer day. So if you are a scientist and you're concerned about where stuff goes when eruptions happen, whether that is just steam during regular day, or if it's ash during an explosive eruption, then weather and the direction of the wind is a big deal. So scientists are really interested in learning and care a lot about figuring out where the ash goes when volcanoes blow, figuring out how these ash columns actually work. Of course, nobody can stop volcanic eruptions from happening, but we can figure out how to reduce the impacts of eruptions when they do happen. So as an example, if there's a volcano that erupts and sends ash into the air, if there was a plane that was scheduled to take off and go into that area, maybe that plane stays on the ground and waits until it's safe. Or if there's a plane that's already in the air and scientists know that an eruption happens and they know where the ash is, then a new flight plan, a new path can be figured out for those pilots so that the planes and the people inside of them can stay safe. So this all depends on being able to understand how ash columns work and the science behind them. So we're gonna be scientists today, and like good scientists, we are going to make observations. So as you can see, there are four volcanoes all around us, and your mission is to make as many observations as you can about the shape and the structure of the ash columns in these photos from these four different eruptions. So you have one minute to make all of the observations that you can possibly make about really both the similarities in the shape and the structure of the ash columns and the differences in the shape and the structure. So what's the same? What's different? Take a minute to figure that out. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we are going to use our cells and our motions to model what's going on inside the ash column and how things get so far up and so far away when volcanoes blow. I'm already in a good space for this. I have a place to move my legs. I have a place to move my arms. So please go ahead and get into a comfortable space like that. Um, in while you're doing that, I am just going to pull out my good friend, 
the bread crust bomb. And I'm doing this to get myself a little bit out of breath and remind myself how heavy this is. But also again to just get, be amazed at how volcanoes can throw rocks that are big and heavy like this out from the vent up into the sky. And rocks that are smaller like this and like this and of course, volcanic ash, which is the size of powdered sugar. So when I've been talking about this, I keep saying thrown up into the air and that's part of the story, but that's not the whole story. If I have this ball and I throw it up into the air, what's gonna happen to the ball? It's gonna come back down, right? There, it came back down, right? So. If I threw these rocks up into the air just by myself, they'd come back down. I'm not gonna do that because they're rocks. But I know that there's gotta be something else going on in the ash column that lets it go 15 miles into the sky and then bits of rock go to different states and travel around the world. There's more than just throwing the rocks up really, 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 really fast. So we're going to look at what's going on inside the ash column. Okay, the first part of the ash column is called the jet phase. And that is just like this ball being thrown up into the air. So I'm going to try to throw this ball up really, 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 really fast. Pew! Oh, there it goes. And my dog found it. <laughs> okay, so we have to start this. <clears throat> part of the ash column and modeling its motion, we're going to lower ourselves down. Okay. Now you can choose to do this fast if you can, and if you're comfortable with that and if that's safe for you, or you can choose to do it nice, slowly in slow motion. Either is fine. I'm going to try to do it really fast. I'm probably going to get myself out of breath a little bit, but the idea here is that the motion of what's going on is just being tossed upwards, tossed upwards. And its momentum is what is controlling its motion. So how fast it is when it first came out of the volcano and how much stuff came out of the volcano. So I'm gonna try to be a really, really, really high momentum eruption where I'm going really, really fast upwards. So I'm gonna be high momentum going really, really fast. So I'm gonna go up in the jet phase, jet phase. Jet phase, jet phase, and I think that's enough for me, but I'm going to bring, bring it up nice and slow. And again, if you need to take that slowly, please do. The important thing is to think about how it's just like being tossed up in the air, whether you're doing it slowly or fast. So after the jet phase is where it starts getting really, really interesting. This is what's called the convective phase, and the convective phase is a whole lot like an air balloon. When you have an air balloon, you have, of course, air. In a balloon, you have um, maybe a flame underneath that's heating it up. And so that air inside the balloon is heating up, it's expanding, it's becoming less dense, it's becoming lighter than the air around it. And so it's buoyant, which means it floats and it's floating upwards. Same thing is going on here. The stuff that comes out of volcanic eruptions is, of course, very, very hot. The hot gas, the hot rocks. And as it's moving upward, you can see there's all these like puffs of gray. And that's air, this regular old air from around the eruption getting mixed in. So that air is getting mixed in and it's heating up. And so then that's expanding. And so this whole thing is expanding and rising. So let's go back down. Okay, so from here, we're going to be focusing our attention on our arms. And what our arms will be doing is they'll be coming outwards, outwards, because it's expanding. It's also going to be coming upwards because it's rising. And the other thing is I'm going to move my wrists. I'm just going to kind of rotate this around to kind of mimic that motion of the air being mixed in. And that's what's starting to make the expansion happen. So very, very slowly, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to bring my arms basically diagonal because it's going outwards. It's going upwards 
and I'm also mixing. Okay, and I'm gonna move into the center right here. Okay, so I'm convective phase. Okay, I'm gonna do that one more time. Convective phase, I'm expanding, I'm rising, expanding, I'm rising one more time. Convective phase, expanding and rising, expanding and rising, expanding and rising. Cool. Now the third part of the third part of the ash column is called the umbrella region, and it sure does look like an umbrella. But I kind of think of it like a scuba diver because a scuba diver will carry weights with them. They'll have air on their back, and then when they're diving. They're <clears throat> adjusting the amount of air that's in the suit that they're wearing. And they do that so that they're not too light and they're not too heavy. They're what's called neutrally buoyant. So they're not floating up, they're not floating down. So as the convective region, or as the, the rocks in the convective region, were expanding outward and outward and outward and rising and rising because it's buoyant, eventually it reaches a spot where it's no longer buoyant it's just the same density of the stuff around it. And so at that point, it just kind of glides to the side. So just like a scuba diver, when it's what's called neutrally buoyant, so <clears throat> when it's what's called, when they're what's called neutrally buoyant, they'll just be able to gently kick their fin and then glide. Same kind of thing when ash gets to that region, it just glides to the side. Whatever way the wind is going, if there's wind, it will go in that direction but otherwise it just glides to the side. So just bring your arms up, just bring your arms up and glide them. And I'm gonna rotate because that feels nice, but just glide to the side. Just focus on a nice smooth motion. And just think about that ash being controlled by the winds, gliding to the side, traveling further and further and further away, gliding to the side, gliding to the side and spreading out. Your first challenge for this week is to either record yourself doing these motions or your own motions that are representative of jet phase where it's being thrown up like a ball, ball just being thrown into the air, the convective phase where it's expanding and rising, expanding and rising, or the umbrella region where it's that part where it no longer floats it's neutrally buoyant, and so it just glides to the side like a scuba diver. You can also just send us your best explanation for how this works. There's a lot of going on, and we would love to hear how you can explain this science. Again, here are your two options for the first challenge for this week. Your first option is that you could create your own motions to model the parts of an ash column. Again, that's the jet phase, the convective phase, and the umbrella region. You could take a video of yourself doing this. You could also just write it down and describe it. And you can send this to us at the form on our website. The second choice that you have is maybe you just want to write. So in your own words, explain how rocks can go so high in the air and travel far away from volcanoes. How does that work? Construct your best explanation. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, so we are almost done with today's program, but we're not quite done yet. The last thing that I wanna share with you is challenge level two. So we've already shared the challenge about making your own moves or describing in your own words how an ash column works. Now, if you wanna take our challenges to the next level, you can complete challenge level two. And here's what it is. You will be a scientist on a mission and this is your mission you are a scientist working in an area with frequent volcanic eruptions your mission is to help flight planners figure out a safe path for airplanes if there was to be a volcanic eruption hmm so what kind of information do you need how do you get that information is it something that as a scientist you can measure with some sort of scientific device? Is it something that you need to ask somebody else for? Something that you need to work with somebody to get that kind of information? Think about 
what do you need to know in order for that plane, which is going between somewhere and to somewhere, and that volcano that's erupting, and where is that stuff going? How do you make sure that airplane stays safe through all of that? And how do you work with the flight planners to give them the information that they need? So there's a lot here, but I encourage you to put on your creative hat. So you can create a comic strip to show a story of you as a scientist, uh, getting that kind of information you need and making a plan and working with others. Or you can write down um, a plan for how you would do that yourself. So I would try to figure this out and I would do it in this way. It's up to you how you do that, but we are excited to see what you submit to us for both challenge level one and challenge level two. It's been so much fun being a guest on Volcano Tuesdays today. I hope to be at Volcano Tuesdays again and share some interesting, cool, awesome things that I know about volcanoes and just get excited with all of you who are tuning in remotely. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you at next week's Volcano Tuesdays. Bye. Wow. Thank you so much, Sonia, for sharing with us such exciting and wonderful content. A special thank you to all of the photographers who took these amazing photographs of volcanoes erupting around the world, as well as the team at Vol Film. Again, that's Volcano Film, V-O-L-F-I-L-M. They produce amazing educational videos about volcanoes, make sure to check out their website. We've included a link on our own website. Thanks again so much for tuning in and for learning with us today. A reminder to complete the challenges that Sonia outlined and send us pictures of you, your family members and friends participating in those challenges. We'll be sure to post on our Volcano Tuesday for upcoming weeks.